Mm. 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 James chapter 1. It feels like we might be in this for a while. Um, we are going to go from 13 to 15 today. <clears throat> so let's stand up for the reading. Um, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. God, uh, I pray that you be with us as we walk through this today. Um, we love you. Amen. Amen. You want to have a seat? You know, we've been talking about something I'm an expert at lately. Sin. Sin. <laughs> I'm really good at it. I'm actually, I can probably say that with pride. <laughs> I'm really good at sin. In general, though, there is two responses that a believer will have towards trials. One, we will either lean into God, we either hold on to God, we will either embrace God and see the trial as growth, as a tool, and trust Him to carry us through these trials with the outcome. Or, we will blame God for us being in the situation and curse Him all the way until we're either out of the trial or on to greener pastures. It's generally the way we do it. We like to blame other people. Um, we love it. Things go wrong in our life. It's not my fault. So you know. You know. It, it's not. No matter what, it's not my fault. Um, and I'm sure it's not your fault. Um, it's your mom's fault. It's your wife's fault. It's your kid's fault. Um, I mean, just pick someone. As long as it's not you. Yeah, it's Jay's fault. Why not? I got you. Amen. What is it not? The scapegoat. And you know, last week we talked about uh, remaining steadfast under trial and the testing. You know, we've been talking about testing the faith and, and talking about trials as we've been walking through this and, and, and testing. There's a difference between being tested and being tempted. There, there, there's a big difference between being tested and being tempted. You walk through the Old Testament and God tested Abraham. God tested Israel. Sometimes they passed. Most of the time, they failed. He tested them in order to grow them, brought, brought forth a trial. But tempting... Tempting is a lot different. Tempting is when we are enticed to sin. But a lot of us don't see the difference in that, do we? Being tested and being tempted. We kind of have the mindset that when we are in the midst of a struggle, we're in the midst of the fight, that... It's just because of sin. Only sin. That's the only reason why we would ever struggle. And that any kind of success in our life is because we've conquered sin and we've overcome and that we are living in victory because we've been force-fed a gospel that is not a gospel at all. We've been force-fed the prosperity gospel and, and, and the, the heart of the prosperity gospel is, is mixing law and gospel and mixing um, the eternal promises with the promises for today. With, with the prosperity gospel, we, 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 we think that we live this victorious life here and now as long as we don't sin. 
As long as we say, say good. And that, that trials only come in our life because that we have sin in our life. And to tell you the truth, that's not, that's not true. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world that is full of sin because of Adam. Because of this. And as a result of, of sin, we not just our sin, but the sin of the world, we fall into trials, we fall into temptation, we fall into tests. And we've been force-fed these gospels at different levels. Entry, we got entry level prosperity gospel where, where it's just kind of like, oh yeah, if I do, do wrong, bad things happen. If I do good, all the good things will happen. Then, then you, you, you go up to the next level and then, then it's like, well, God wants me to be rich. Well, God wants me to be healthy and God wants me to be this. But if I sin, then I don't get to have any of that. There's a problem with that though. Every single person on this earth right now is a sinner. Out of your nature comes sin. <coughs> Sorry. God brings testing and trials into our life to test our faith and for us to learn to lean into Him. For us to learn to endure the struggles and to endure the trials. These trials are just the adversities of life. We have adversities in life each and every day. We have adversities in life that come from, from just living in this fallen world. We have adversities in life that just come from, from the, the nature that comes in. But God brings us into these trials to grow us into who He's called us to be. We don't grow very well when we're not going through hard times. Trials are adversities. It's part of life. I looked up a bunch of things for, for temptations, though. And I kind of touched on it a second ago. But, and, and that's not really the best definition I could really, really bring is that an enticement to sin, to enticement for sin or evil, being allured by evil desires. 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. So we try to blame, you know, we, we either want to, to embrace God in our struggle or we want to blame God in our temptations. We want, we want to embrace or blame. That, that's really kind of where we balance. And sometimes the, during the same trial, we'll go up and down. We'll embrace what God is doing. And then we'll struggle with God being at fault. And, and we'll go back and forth in the midst of all of this. But think of that. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, those, that's the root of all sin. The lust of the flesh. Those things that we do that make us feel good, that desire, the things that we desire against the things of God, and then the lust of the eyes, I mean, that's kind of easy, and then pride in our life. So trials come from adversity in life, and temptation comes from alluring, being allured to sin. We all want someone to blame. Ever since the beginning. If you remember the scene in the garden, uh, they were told, do not, they, get, they were placed there, work the garden, do not eat from the, from, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can eat from any other tree in the garden. You, can, you have free reign, but do not eat from this tree, for when you do, you will surely die. <coughs> Serpent comes, starts talking to Eve, did God surely, did God say? Did God really say? Is that really what God said? Oh yeah, and then she added to the word of God. And then she ate and then she tempted her, her, her husband to eat. Then they realized they were naked. God comes, cool of the day, strolling in. Where are you? Oh, we were naked. So we were hiding. I told you were naked. <coughs> you ate from the tree, didn't you? It's not like he didn't know. 
they had an opportunity to confess. And and he's like, Adam's like, it's the woman that you gave me. She gave it to me to eat. And she's like, it's, it was the serpent. Everybody, ever since then, everybody has wanted someone to blame. I, I went through life blaming my mother for all kinds of things because I grew up in a, in a, in a very terrible way. And, and I, I blamed her. And when I started to grow up and take responsibility for my action, I realized, yeah, I was influenced in a lot of things, but I can't blame her for the, the way that my life turned out. I can't blame her for the choices that I made. Uh, I had to grow up and, and be a man and, and take responsibility for my own actions. But we still want to place blame on someone because no matter what, we don't want to take responsibility for the things that we do. We want to play victim all the time. See it all the way through set free. It's not my fault. If you wouldn't have sent me to Trimble, I wouldn't have done that. Or if you wouldn't have sent me over here, if you wouldn't have sent me there. You mean if I would have delicately cared for you like a flower that you are and softly groomed you and pruned you so not to make you uncomfortable or anything, then you wouldn't have drank and ate Kratom or something. My bad. <laughs> then we start learning about God's sovereignty. And, and, and what, what's, what's the first thing people do? Oh, God's in control? He's in control of everything? So God made me sin. Yep, that's it. God made me sin. God did it. That's not my fault. It's not my fault. That's why I don't... That's why I don't don't stand with, with the world's view that addiction is a disease. Because if addiction is a disease and, and we relapse, then it's our disease coming back. It's, you know, they, they relate it to cancer. And, and if cancer comes back, then, then, then it's not our fault. So if, if addiction is, is um, a disease and it comes back, oh my gosh, it's not my fault. I, it, it just came back and I don't know what happened. No. We want someone to blame. We want someone to blame besides ourselves. So, so we'll blame anybody for the circumstance that we are in except for taking responsibility for our actions. Instead of taking responsibility for the mess that we have caused. And we learn about God's sovereignty. And we're like, oh man, yes. He created <coughs> me to sin. <laughs> And the fun part is we will twist it up and, and we'll try to re like really, really church it up. And we'll try to explain it away really well. Okay, so, Pastor, what you're saying? So, God knows all things, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. God is in control of all things. Yeah? So, He ordains all things. Yeah. So, it's not my fault I got high. Second London, London Confession, chap, paragraph, or chapter 5, paragraph 4, says this, The almighty power, unsearchable wisdom, and infinite goodness of God are so demonstrated in His providence. This is, this is good. So providence, um, providence is good. Uh, it, it comes from the word videre. It's a, it's a Latin term. And videre is where we get the word video. So it's, it's to see. Video is, is something that you look at. <clears throat> and and pro is before so it's like to see before and take care of it um, as, as a man I'm called to provide for my family um, I'm called to provide things we're called to provide that means that I see the need today and I look ahead and take care of it before it, it's actually there I know that every night we're hungry so I got to make sure that there's food for us to cook to provide to look ahead I don't Try not to wait till the last minute or, you know, is, is, you understand? Okay. Look ahead. So the almighty power, unsearchable wisdom, and infinite goodness of God are so demonstrated in his providence that his sovereign plan includes even the first fall and every other sinful action 
both of angels and humans. So His plan has incorporated all sin. God's providence over sinful actions does not occur by simple permission. Instead, God most wisely and powerfully limits and in other way arranges and governs sinful actions. Through a complex arrangement of methods, He governs sinful actions to accomplish His perfectly holy purposes. Yet, He does this in such a way that the sinfulness of their act arises only from the creature and not from God. Because God is altogether holy and righteous, He can neither originate or approve sin. Um, I know that might sound a little like, uh, uh, uh. Yeah. In Acts chapter 2, this is definitely not in there. <laughs> so, so Acts chapter 2, 22 and 23. Uh, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Okay, so you see God's sovereignty right there, right? Definite plan and and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Man's responsibility. Same act. God's divine providence. God's sovereignty in that His plan was for Jesus to be crucified. And His plan for Jesus to be crucified was orchestrated through the hands of sinful men acting on their own impulses. Acting on their own desires. It was their desires to crucified Jesus and God used their desires to crucify Jesus in order to accomplish his sovereign plan. I don't know if that helps at all, but he's God. God uses your sin for his purposes. For the big picture, the grand scheme of all of this, God uses your sin. Here's what some of you hear. Amen. So I'm in God's plan. That's what you're saying. <laughs> I'm in God's plan. My sin is good because God's going to use it. Uh, no. <laughs> if you're trying to figure out how all this works, because that's, that's how I am. I'm going to lay in bed and go, okay, so God's in control. And, but I still have to do things. <laughs> It doesn't. Ah. He's God. Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine. Secret things belong to the Lord. I don't get it. But the Bible is very clear that God is in control. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. I, it it's one of those things that that oh oh yeah God 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 sovereign yeah yeah I get that yeah He's in control. But once you truly see it, it's on every single page of the book. You see it and you're like. Man, that's God. That's God. God did this. God did this. God did this. God. And you're like, whoa. But God uses our stupidity. Remember that. He's factored in your stupidity into his plan for your life. That's which is for all of us is great. God's sover, sovereign over all things. He uses all things to accomplish his purposes, chooses people for his use, and is still not the one who's guilty of sin. Still not the one who's guilty of sin. The best way I can put this, this is the easiest way that I can make it to understand. I did dope for like 20 years. I, I did ran, did my thing. It was my own desire, the lust of my flesh, the lust of my eyes, the pride of my life, led me to live this sinful life for so many years. But God pulled me out of that and, and transferred me all the way well, from the domain of darkness to, to the light of his marvelous son, as it says in Colossians. But then he transplanted me from uh, the west coast to the east coast to come to accomplish his purposes by preaching the gospel to other people who have been in sin and in their lifestyle so that God can continue that forward with you in your life in the way that he chooses to do. Whether it's just 
Um, ministry, I, I say just, it's not like a demeaning thing. I mean, whether it's uh, ministering to the street, being a, a husband, being a father, preaching the gospel to your kids, preaching the gospel to your neighbor, preaching the gospel no matter where you go, in, in, in the way that you work, in, in the way that God moves in your life. God did that in His sovereign purposes, and he, he did it in my life. He can do it in yours. That's how big God is. But He did not cause you to sin, but He will use your sin in order to accomplish His purposes. Because there's one thing that I know, is that if I was a three-piece suit preacher, how many of you guys would listen? Not a dang one of you. You're like, oh, this guy, he don't know where we're coming from. Amen. Amen. That's why God uses sinful people to accomplish His purposes. God didn't do anything like that to me. But God kept me safe in order to accomplish His purpose and use me. Verse 13, God cannot be tempted with evil and He Himself does not tempt anyone. It's not God's fault you're in sin. God's not going to cause the sin and then redeem the sin. I mean, that, that's, that's kind of weird. Kind of weird. But then look at verse 14. Each person, because we got to know where it comes from, right? If God didn't do it, and I can't blame my mom, and I can't blame my wife, and I can't blame my kids, and I can't blame my brother. Who do I blame? I always think of that that Scooby Doo uh, meme. Have you guys seen it? You're like, it's. I think it's Scooby Doo. You know, because they always unmask the villain. And you're like, who's the cause of all this heartache in my life? And he takes out the mask, and it's him. Verse 14. Sorry, but each person. Hey, it is what it is. God just made me this way. No, it's, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. <clears throat> the temptations that you face, the struggles that you face, when you are lured, you are lured, you are enticed by what? Your own desires. It is your own desire that led you to be where you're at. It's you. You did this to you. I did this to me. Because if it was not a desire that you have, it couldn't be a temptation. It can't be a temptation if it's not tempting. I mean, that, that's, it can be, look nice, but if it's not tempting, it's not a true temptation. <laughs> The defilement in your life, the sin in your life, the temptations in your life well up from inside of you because of the nature that you have because of your father, Adam. In the head of the covenant, in the head of mankind, wait, so how he went, so goes all of his followers. In the same manner, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, as he goes, everyone who believes in him will go Behind. Let's turn to Mark chapter 7. This is a fun one. Mark chapter 7. Because Jesus kind of lays it out. You know, he's talking about food. He's talking about hand washing. Because the Jews, they were all, oh, you got to wash your hands like 15 times. Rinse 15 times. Because you don't want anything that is defiled to go into your body you know we can't have pork and we can't have shrimp and we can't have all these things because they will defile your body and jesus says look what goes into you isn't what defiles you in verse in, uh mark 7 uh actually sorry in verse 20 he says what comes out of a person is what defiles him for from within out of the heart of man okay Who's breathing in here? Okay. Most of you guys. Okay. Good. <laughs> Does anybody have a heartbeat? Okay. Is there anything going on there? Well, for those of you guys that are alive, that are still breathing, it says, from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Yeah. 
Our hearts are wicked and deceitful and beyond cure. Who can understand it? And we all know Jeremiah 17. Well, maybe we don't. It's Jeremiah 17. 9 through 10, right? Yeah, sure. He's just saying, yeah. Our hearts are wicked and deceptive. Out of the wellspring of our heart comes all sorts of evil desires. Our hearts are dead. We have no life before God gives us life. We are dead in our trespasses and sin until God does something in us. There's no cure for our corruption within ourselves. We are completely to blame for the evil, the immorality, the pride, the adultery, the slander. All that wells up inside of us. All those struggles, all that temptation, all that sin that is in us is our fault. It is our fault. It's my fault that I sin. It's your fault that you sin. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. It's the desires that we want. It's what we want. Why do we do it? Because we like it. It's fun. It's pleasing to the flesh. The lust of the flesh, it, it's... And other, other, some translations say desires of the flesh. It's just what I want. My eyes, oh, I see. It's what I want. Think about this. Who has ever been told to follow your heart? That's the worst advice ever. <laughs> The most toxic person in your life is you. Is your heart. And for someone to tell you, just follow your your heart. Okay? Just go satisfy yourself. Go live in sin. Go do whatever it is that you want. Go destroy yourself. Verse 15, it, it, it just continues on. The desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. It's progression. It's like a ladder, man. You, you, so here's how it goes. A thought comes to your mind, right? And you're like, no. And it comes back in your mind. No. And it comes back. And you're like, eh. <laughs> and it comes back. And you're like, hmm. And it rolls over. It rolls over. And it rolls over. And you start thinking about this, don't you? Maybe it's just me. I'm, I, I don't want to project what goes on in my head on you guys. Because I, I understand you guys have uh, progressed. By the way. And this overwhelming desire just comes on and you're like, you know it's wrong. You know it's like, if I do this, this, this is not going to be good. It's not going to be good. But it's like, <sighs> maybe it's like, thoughts of drink and start using it and start defiling yourself again. Doesn't even you know the the lust the the desires of your heart just start to manifest and grow and grow and grow and grow. I mean, it doesn't even have to be like for, fornicatory. Yeah, that's my new word, fornicatory. <laughs> I, I just yeah. I heard you guys just make up new words, so I just make it up my new words. So here's the definition of fornicatory. <laughs> of the persuasion of fornication. <laughs> <laughs> but that lust it doesn't have to be uh, uh, adult and desires I don't know if there's kids in here or not so just for million just Maya huh it doesn't have to be sexual in your thought lust isn't all about uh, the sexual desire lust is about anything that can overwhelm you a desire away from God. And it seems that sometimes when we have these desires, they they just like don't get quenched and you just like sit there with it, sit there with it, sit there with it, sit there with it. And like, you know, we are instant gratification kind of people. And so when we're overwhelmed with this stuff, we want instant relief. That's that's why uh 
<clears throat> your progression in drugs went from doing lines to shooting because none of that stuff was fast enough. I want it now. You can't blame God. You can't blame God. You can't blame God because it's your desires that are taking you captive. It's your struggles, your temptation is grabbing onto your heart. The Bible says, uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians uh, 10, 5, in context, I'm going I'm to nail it in context. He's talking about false teaching and, and, and uh, people that are teaching against, but it's applicable to this, to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. <coughs> Sounds real easy, doesn't it? Sounds easy. It's not. It is not easy. There's a song, I can't remember, uh, uh, it was a great band, uh, but the song was said, just say Jesus. When you don't know what to say, it was, on, it was on the radio a lot like 10 years ago. When you don't know what to say, just say Jesus. And, and if your mind works the way that I do, you say it about three times and then you're like, Phew, off and running. And a lot of times, the only way that that overwhelming desire gets satisfied is if we give into it. And once we give into it, then the guilt and the shame and the condemnation of our own hearts, because we condemn ourselves. We, 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 unless you're so prideful to believe that, 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 or arrogant, I should say, that eh, it's no big deal. The results of this stuff overwhelming and taking you. Desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. When we start taking the action, it gives birth to that sin. And sin, once it's fully born and, and fully manifested, brings forth death. Death. This can't come from God. God said at the end of... Of everything he created, he looked upon everything and saw that it was good. I'm going to give kind of a, a little jump into a little bit of next week. We're not going to go through the whole thing. But 16 through 18 says, do not be deceived, my beloved brother. That's a good statement to kind of transition this. God cannot be tempted. It's you doing this. Do not be deceived, brothers. It's important because he's talking to believers. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's not talking to the world. He's not talking to us. He says, and then 17 says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Temptation isn't a good and perfect gift, but what is a good and perfect gift? <laughs> Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from God. God didn't give you your sin, God redeemed you from sin. You were believer. Remember this, dear. Brothers, That means he's talking to people that already know Christ. Talking to people that are already in relationship with Christ. Talking with people that already are saved. You were dead in your trespasses and sin, but God, who is rich in mercy, forgave you of all of your iniquity. Even to the point of when his children are trapped in sin, when his people are in bondage, he's still rich in mercy. By the grace of God, he brings life. We have life. Sin brings forth death. God, through his son, Jesus Christ, brings life and freedom in himself. No wavering, no change in circumstances, nothing can deter God from his love for his children. Romans 8, 31 through 39, man, that explains that. It's neither life nor death, or principalities or 
things of this world, things to come, blah, 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 ever be able to save right, his children for the love that's in Christ Jesus. But God is faithful to not leave you in your sin. He doesn't want you to stay there. He gave you a lifeline. It's the gospel. It's Jesus Christ. That is your way out. You need the gospel just as much today, believer, as you did the day that you came to faith. You need to learn to rest in the finished work of Christ on the cross. That's what it is. The redemption of Christ, of, of, of your redemption in Christ from sin and bondage by the blood that was shed on Calvary. That is so important for our life. We need to be reminded each and every day of what Christ has done for us. We need to be reminded each and every day of the salvation and the hope that we have in Christ. We need to be reminded each and every day that this ain't over. The gospel is just simply good news. Good news that Christ has called the people to himself. He has paid their penalty as a propitiation for their sin by His blood. And by faith in Him, you have eternal life. Knowing Him, believing in Him, and then trusting in Him. <clears throat> for our salvation lies is in Christ. The faith in Christ is the only hope to get out of this bondage of sin and death. Amen? Let's pray. Father, uh, <clears throat> Lord, help us. <clears throat> sin can be a, a terror on us at times, Lord. Sometimes we just love it. Lord, but I pray that <clears throat> that we can trust you, rest in you. Lord, it's the hope of our salvation, Lord. That we can hold on to you as the author and perfecter of our faith, Lord that we can rest in, in your freedom, Lord, that, that you love us even though whether we're in sin, Lord, but you love us enough to not leave us there, Lord. I pray that we can turn away and turn to you, Lord. Lord, our salvation is secured, is trusted in you. But man, this life could be a struggle when we're wallowing in our sin. When we're submitted to sin, Lord, when we're surrendered to sin. Lord, I pray that you help us to, to come out of it, Lord, to repent, to, to change our mind, Lord, about that sin. <clears throat> I pray that if anyone in here doesn't know you, Lord, that you continue to penetrate their hearts, Lord, with your word. <clears throat> that we can, that you grant us eternal life and we can repent in you. <clears throat> that we can know you, and believe you, and trust in you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.